Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Sometimes on this podcast, we have to take you to some dark places, like the summer of 1987. And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more, as always. My name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals and pick their brain about uh, current projects, how they got started, state of the industry, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion. Uh, And if you like how we do things, because that is how we do things, uh, that'd be great if you could uh, follow us, uh, subscribe to our podcast. I don't know why I got tongue-tied there for a minute, but yes, subscribe to our podcast. You can find us basically over on Apple, Spotify, uh, Google, uh, basically wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, you know, and you should do that. And if you can do something else, that'd be great. Follow us on social media. Uh, give us a chance and follow us on either Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at either at In The Seats or at It's Podcast One for all sorts of updates. And finally, and most importantly, please pay us a visit over at In The Seats, in the seats.ca for all the latest and greatest movie news, reviews, and anything else we can think of under the sun to be perfectly frank because uh, we love talking about the moving image and we love it when you read about it because well it's it's what we do but uh we got a fun one on this episode we talk with director stephen kijak about his film shoplifters of the world which takes us to like i said at the beginning a very dark time it's the summer of 1987 And uh, we meet four friends who are reeling with the sudden breakup of the iconic band, The Smiths. And they uh, they embark on a night out to party and mourn their musical loss. At the same time, though, there's an impassioned Smiths fan who takes a little local radio DJ hostage and forces him to play nothing but The Smiths all night long. It's, this movie is pure 80s. It is a hell of a lot of fun. It is nostalgic. It is... It is sweet, and it, it, it really works, and it really just sit, really gives the musical time period a, a, a real distinct framework. Uh, and we had a, such a fun time talking with Steven, not just about sort of uh, the influence for the movie, but how it got started and everyone who's involved. It's a really, it's an interesting film, and we've got uh, people like Joe Mangia- Manginello, uh, Thomas Lennon, and a few, and a bunch of, uh, well, fairly un unknown young uh, young smiths fans in the film and again it's one of those charming little gems that you will discover on vod uh this coming friday but uh first off let's uh, talk with steven and talk a little bit not just about the smiths but uh, about the movie as well and uh, reminisce about the 80s that were all right well i mean obviously first off congratulations on the movie man i got an absolute kick out of it because i will admit I was both a Smith fan and a metalhead, so I was somewhere. Yes. I was that, I was that line in between. Yeah, well, I mean, you and me both. I was uh, a card carrying member of the Kiss Army at age seven. Walk walk me through, I guess, sort of the inspiration for the story, because uh, like I was reading the notes, is this this is based on actual events or inspired by it at the very least? It's, I mean, like it says on screen, inspired by true intentions. Okay. Uh, Once upon a time, uh, a young Smiths fan in uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, was so upset that his band had broken up and he was so annoyed by the crap that the local radio station would play uh, that he went to the station with a bag of Smiths cassettes and a rifle uh, with every intention of storming the building and forcing the Smiths onto the airwaves once and for all. and uh, he ended up losing his nerve, but instead of just driving home, uh, he asked a security guard to uh, call the police on him because uh, he desperately needed some help. He was at a very low point in his life. And so he basically just got carted away and nothing really happened, uh, but it did make the paper. And from there, it just blossomed into this urban myth of uh, a holdup at the station um, which I'm told has inspired the movie Airheads, although it's not quite exactly uh, a comparable situation. Um, so yeah, that that's kind of the seeds of it. And you, there's some articles written about, you know, someone tracked down the security guard and talked to him about his experience. And I think the guy that uh, attempted to hold up station 
is on record as talking about th- that time. I've been trying to find the guy, and I, it's been absolutely impossible. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, and then the origin of this is that I, I had been kind of tinkering with a story about my new wave youth. And uh, I had the characters, but I didn't really have a story to stick them in. And uh, Lorianne Hall, who has the story credit on the project, grew up in Denver and had, you know, she was in L.A. at the time. And we were just having a cocktail and chatting about stuff. And she asked me if I had remembered this thing that happened in Denver when the Smiths broke up. And I hadn't. But I thought, God, it sounds like a great idea for a movie. Uh, So I just took my kids and moved him to Denver on that night. And we, and voila, you know, we, what a great movie. So we, we set about, you know, she wrote a treatment, I wrote a script uh, and, and there we go. We just thought it would be great to kind of give this young man his, uh, you know, his day and actually let him go through with, with it and just see what happened. Um, well, well, I mean, I guess that's, that, that kind of dovetails into my next question though, because I mean, for your past few projects, it's been a lot of documentaries, a lot of music documentaries. And I guess, I mean, it feels like if you've just done a straight Smith documentary, it may not have been in as impassioned. It definitely feels like this is more, you want to do something more about the Smiths fan as opposed to the Smiths. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's my, it's my very personal, you know? Like I said, the, the characters, it's me and my friends growing up in the 80s. I mean, I essentially made this film for like five people. Uh, and if everyone else tunes in and relates, it's, you know, that's great. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, a, a lot of the films I have done more recently, you know, it's been a lot of work for hire kind of stuff. I mean, mm. I'm very passionate about the work, um, but, you know, uh, it's, I've been wanting to tell my story about my band uh, for a while and yeah if we had just I don't think a, I, I, you know, I think making a Smith documentary is comes with a lot of problems uh, given the state of the Morrissey Marr relationship yeah. and just kind of the state of, of all of that in the here and now whereas you know uh, doing something that actually just kind of dipped into nostalgia um, and just cloaked a story in that fandom and in that music, just it, it just seemed a lot more fun and engaging for me anyway. Um, and again, it was just like right time, right place. Like the idea of, of actually taking this, this myth, um, which itself is completely steeped in the Smiths. It's Smith lore. Uh, it just seemed like a great, great move, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, I, we we love the Smiths. So there we go, twenty songs, fully licensed. Um, and uh, yeah, we did. It. Well, I mean, I've got to imagine the licensing was probably the biggest headache of all. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it wasn't. <laughs> it was. Yeah, it was just. It's a lot of music. It's a lot of money. Uh, and you know, you're dealing with two managers, two publishers. Two, you know, and but the record label was really supportive. I got to say, it wasn't you know, it just, it's, it just takes a long time to work out the nuts and bolts or something like this. We actually had kind of a goodwill thumbs up pretty early on from both sides. Uh, it was more about just raising the money and getting the deal done. You know, a, a music budget like that on an independent film just kind of skews the economics of an, of an independent film budget uh, to a degree where, you know, you're going to be struggling to get what you need just, you know, for the actual production itself. So, that was that was tough. It was a tight shoot. Well, and talk to me a little bit about the casting as well. I imagine you got to call you you have to call in a few favors, get people like Joe on board, and uh, and not only that, but like Thomas Lennon and uh, I loved LR and Elena in the movie as well. I can imagine you were very. The casting process was probably a little stressful for you to try to find the right people for the right parts. Well, you know, Joe and his brother are producers on the film. Uh, Joe kind of came in really early Uh, without him and without those two. I mean, there really would be no film. Um, Yeah, it was like just a a friend of mine, a casting director, uh, Monica Mickelson, uh, who ended up moving over to run casting at Paramount. Um, She she was going to cast it initially and uh, 
just had the idea to, sh uh, to share it with Joe uh, when she heard that they were starting to look for things to produce. And he, he just, he took to it immediately. He was like, he was like, you know, the metal head who got turned on to the Smiths when a sports injury forced him into drama club. And all of a sudden all his friends were listening <laughs> to the Smiths. So he's like, he, he fit, you know, he's in, he's got one foot in both worlds. And, uh, and he is a true like metal dude. He really like, he just took to that. And, you know, the battle vest, all the, everything about the character, he really, he built that himself. It was so organic. Uh, and he was just so awesome in it. He's so funny. Um, and uh, yeah, so he really anchored it from the get go. And it took us so goddamn long to make this film that I think the cast, we cast it and it fell apart maybe three times. Oh, wow. So, I mean, some of the some of the actors we'd initially had attached are still like, if you Google search it, they're still somehow the fucking algorithm is still attaching them to the movie. It's like that was five years ago that, you know, Jessica Brown Findlay is not in this movie. Um, but yeah, so we were we were casting like right down to the wire. But man, I'm really glad it cycled out the way it did because they're they're phenomenal. You know, um, LR is just great. Uh Helena too, you know, she, she was probably the last person to get cast. Um, and, you know, just come off of Madeline's Madeline out of Sundance mm. where reviewers were comparing her to a young Jenna Rollins, you know, and I, I grew up with Cassavetes. Like I was taught by Ray Carney at BU, you know, the guy that wrote the books on John's films and had really gotten schooled in that stuff very early on. So just the association, like, you know, kind of rang my bell and I'm like, Ooh, Helena Howard, let's talk to Helena. And, uh, you know, she was barely 20, but was raised by a real new wave mom had, uh, you know, her mom's best friend had followed the Smiths around the UK in the eighties. Uh, he had passed away, but left her some stuff, including a Smiths in Scotland tour program that she brought to set, you know, so she felt it real deeply, you know, uh, because not all the kids came to it with a full understanding of, of the music, uh, but she really connected. So it really went deep. So that was really great to have that. Well, and I mean, I guess that, that dovetails into my next question, especially with the young cast. Do you have to sort of crash course them into the music? Yeah. I mean, they all got playlists. Um, it's easy, you know, there's only so much Smith's music out there. So they all kind of did their homework. I, uh, and then I went and made them each uh, like, a little playlist of their characters top five favorite records um and they each had different albums uh, that they liked and so like just to give them more of a complete world of the, like just you know what the sounds and the influence uh for their characters were that extended into just the style and the kind of the you know even the room and just the way they would you know the way they just were were interacting with each other and uh you know what I mean? Like you, you had your favorite little, you know, it's not, they, it wasn't all, all Smiths all the time, you know, and the people that they were based on, I could just think back to high school and be like, Oh yeah, that was everything but the girl. He was you too. There was a little Susan, the Banshees over there. And you know what I mean? So they definitely got a good Sonic education. Well, I'm, you know, speaking from experience, I know my sister would have lit, lit, lit herself on fire if Duran Duran had broken up. So there's definitely <laughs> some reality in this film exactly. for sure. <laughs> yep oh yeah i knew a lot of those too no but i mean i guess that that dovetails into something else i want to ask because i mean i always enjoy movies like this because they are so universal and they are so sort of speaking to not just the experience of being young but just sort of the passion for music and the arts and i'm kind of curious from your perspective what is it about music that is such a gateway into storytelling especially for film um, well, it's primal, you know, it, 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 especially if it's, if it's those songs that reach back into our past, you know, it, it's formative years for a reason we're being formed, you know, you're, at, you, it's like your, your cellular structure is still kind of loose and, and you're, you're, it, you're a sponge at that time of your life and the songs uh, that you're listening to just fuse with those experiences i mean it's it's scientifically proven right i mean we've got yeah. these these uh, the, uh, there's a i was listening to a great podcast of the day about just the way 
the scientific ways that like music and memory works and how certain songs just are just these deep triggers uh, and are just tied to certain emotional and parts of our lives. Uh, and, uh, you know, the best music, it just, you can listen to it over and over and over again and it never grows old. And it tells you a story. It gives you an image or a memory or, you know, creates, it's, it's cinematic, right? I mean, when I first heard Scott Walker's music, to me, it was just this widescreen experience and you just swoon. And I just was determined one day I'm going to make a film about this guy. And the same with this, you know, um, yeah, I, it's, uh, there's a whole other topic of, you know, ownership and fandom that comes into it, which could complicate a project like this. But ultimately, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I don't know, I, I tend to, even some other music films that I've seen don't necessarily use music the same way. I mean, we try, even in the documentaries, to me, it's all narrative and it's all about emotion, like it's all about emotional arcs. You know, we want the music to, to work in a certain way, to feel a certain way. It's a feel thing too. So, you know, across all the films, we try to make the music as much of like a main character and an emotional through line uh, as possible. No, and I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I mean, I think just speaking of your documentaries, I think I felt that with Jacko because I knew the music, but I never quite understood the guy. And I mean, yeah. music really does open up this sort of challenge to 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 get to get to know the people who are you know singing the songs and telling the stories. But I got to imagine with the Smiths because there is this deep rift between Morrissey and Mar, like. This, this feels like like the, when you deal with the Smiths, it almost feels more important to tell the story of the fan as opposed to the guys, because we're never totally. really going to get the story of the guys. If that makes any no, sense. It's, yeah, it's too it's too fraught. I mean, you could, but you'd have to go down that kind of unofficial sort of thing. And, you know, it, whatever is good and great just gets so muddled up in in lawsuits and controversy and, you know, the kind of collapse of a legacy if you will um you know and it's it's just too much it's just too painful to think about and uh you know as it's hard as a fan you know i'm yeah. a fan like i i i they they were everything to me once upon a time and um uh yeah i mean it's it's interesting because the the films i've done about a number of musicians whether i'm a fan of theirs or not i we miraculously always kind of come out the other end with a greater appreciation and a deeper respect and a love of the music. Um, and on this one, you know, it's like, I think this is, this was the way to try to preserve that feeling. Um, Cause like a doc, it just might, you might've flown too close to the sun in a way. And no, for sure. Know, it was painful enough to make, you know, I, I probably didn't listen to the Smiths for maybe a year and a half or so after we finished this thing just because oh fuck it was hard um and a lot of reasons that don't need to get talked about but uh <laughs> not really to do with the the band or anything but just you know um it can be a, a really a triggering experience uh anywho's yeah no um hopefully like this kind of wraps it up in in a fandom and in a in a in a in a, in a, go in a nostalgia that kind of can continue to give off heat if you you know you well know. i think it, i think it does because i mean the fandom and the nostalgia is important and i mean i think this translates from music and film as well because i mean in this business like nobody gets into it not being a fan and i mean this is something i always like to ask but can you think back like was there a movie or sort of a moment in your life that maybe got you into this business it got me into the business um like the pivot point that made you want to make film kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It would definitely, I'd have to, well, I, yeah, I'd definitely blame it on the, the, my, my first, you know, cast of buddies uh, classes at, at undergrad. <clears throat> I mean, those movies really just rocked my world. I mean, I, I was contemplating film as a career. Uh, so it was a little bit of that. And, and I got to say, I, I was coming of age during a, this really this sweet spot of like international auteurs 
So it would be films like, you know, Adam McGoyan's films like Family Viewing or, you know, The Adjuster. Um, I love that you're name dropping Canadian films right now. So. Oh, God. He's one of my favorite, like Patricia Rosamo, right? I mean, she yeah. was, I, I, I just, we had great art houses. At Bo- I went to Boston University and, you know, so we, we had Brattle in the Coolidge Corner and we all, you know, they Peter Greenaway, uh, Al Moldovar, like, we were, you know, he had just released Woman on the Verge of, you know, oh. his breakdown at the time. So between like Law of Desire and that and seeing things like The Cook and the Thief, I, I went I went hard into like Euro art cinema um, or, you know, international stuff. Like I just loved Egoyan's work so much. Um, so it was it was that stuff. You know, before that, I liked movies. I don't think I contemplated making them. Um, I know that like Derek Jarman had a huge impact on me. Uh, things like Last of England and The Garden um, were massively influential. Uh, you know, yeah, I rented Betty Blue in, from the Blockbuster in our town in high school. Probably didn't really understand what I was looking at at the time. Um, but they were starting to seep in, you know. I think we watched Liquid Sky at least once a week. Oh, nice. Uh, back in the day on VHS tape. Thank you very much. Um, so, like, it was the cult stuff. John Waters, of course, you know. Um, so it was that kind of stuff that really started to push my imagination in those those directions. Lynch looms large, you know. Documentary kind of happened to me by accident. Mm. Uh, but then, you know, it's the Maisel brothers, are obviously, and Pennebaker are, are kind of the, the – and Agnes Varda's docs and her features are real, like, touchstones you know so that kind of stuff well i'm I'm with you there and you you should know just adam mcgoyan is an absolute sweetheart of a human being so oh he's <laughs> lovely i've met him i mean i yeah. got i have i have don mckellar actually is in my first feature uh way back when um and he's remained a pal throughout the years he's he's a great filmmaker he and really is last yeah. last night is something that should be revived oh uh, god and, yeah i'm with you on that one. Oh my god sandra oh is in it i mean it's such a good film so dry and so dark and funny um yeah i love him no but you know what i mean just to start putting a bow on this i mean i think what i'm really pulled away from your film is just i mean yeah there is that air of nostalgia and fandom but it's it's not doing it for for shits and giggles it's not being cheap about it it's being honest about it and and i think that's the real magic of it and i'm kind of curious just for like for anything you do going forward because obviously as a filmmaker as a as a working filmmaker you've got to try to balance sort of the creative side that you want to fulfill versus the i need to raise money for this so i can get it sold made and then sold and so on and so forth i can there's always going to be a bit of a balance and dance between those two ideals yeah no completely i mean i mean this one took 10 plus years to make you yeah know? i mean me- meanwhile i'm like making a documentary a year um sometimes two at a, the same time uh and which has been amazing it's become the bread and butter uh this was more of a creative risk um and it's interesting you say that about just the the tone of the nostalgia i mean part of the risk was to do something that actually was unironic yeah. about the 80s you know what i mean um and to try to like, cause to me it's, there's aspects of metafiction to it. You know I mean? It's like quotes within quotes within quotes. I mean, the sl- miss, the Smith's lyrics pop out obviously, but it's, it's all embedded. Almost every other line is from somewhere else, you know, whether it's a Smith's lyric or it's from Oscar Wilde or Sheila Delaney, or it's some quoting Ludus, which was the band fronted by Linda Sterling. It was Marcy's best friend or, you know what I mean? It's just, it gets really nerdy real fast. Um, but it, it, it sits together in such a way that it's presented authentically, not, it's not really arch, uh, <clears throat> which, you know, it could go either way. <laughs> it's a, it is, it's a balance. Um, but I thought like, let's just do this really honestly uh, and keep the kind of the snark at bay um, and try to let the emotion be real, you know? Uh, and then I just think by the nature of the 
the way the script was constructed, it gives itself enough of its own kind of theatrical theatricality, right? There's a little bit totally, of existence yeah. to it, which, uh, you know, was baked in. So yeah, it's, it's tough. Um, there's always those considerations, you know, like the decision to throw myself into yet another one of these, which is what I'm fucking doing next. Um, versus just saying, screw it, get me, you know, get me studio jobs. Uh, which we're also attempting. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, it is, uh, it is, it is a balance uh, for sure. Um, it's always on your mind, but um, I don't know. I, this is a sweet spot for me. I love the music stories. Um, I think there's so many different ways you can tell them. Uh, and, you know, if you do it with enough heart, it's going to come through. Well, and it does come through and it's it's honest and it's sweet and it's tender. And I mean, you know, if you'd been dropping Huey Lewis and Back to the Future references in the movie, I'd have probably been out the door, but it <laughs> wasn't doing that. It was it was giving a real sort of honest and sort of genuine portrait of, of not only the music, but of, of the fandom. And I mean, I think that's the real draw of the film. Oh, uh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, a, a, a person who will remain unnamed, uh, above above me uh in the the structure of this whole thing we had to do a little reshooting and uh, some script pages came through with like mork and mindy references oh and no I, I just i almost like <laughs> had a nervous breakdown i mean i kind of did on set um you know there was just like we have to keep this authentic we can't start pandering you know you just can't do it <laughs> you just can't no you can't um, if you try to make something for all people, you will have made it for no one. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, so anyway. Well, yeah. you're, you're on. <laughs> this, this is honest and keep doing, keep doing the good work, Stephen, man, because this is, this is a, this is a fantastic little film and I think it's going to get a, a good little audience for it. So again, congratulations on the work and keep it up. Thanks, David. I really appreciate talking to you. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.